Hello everyone and welcome back to my biochemistry series. The previous class was an introductory lecture to clinical biochemistry and in today's lecture we will begin the study of the cell and its constituent parts. Lecture 2 has been divided into a number of parts and each part will focus on one or more cell organelles. In this part, which is part 1, we will have a general introduction to the cell, including its definition, types and the difference between the types, as well as the definition and types of organelles and the functions of different organelles. Now, some of you may be thinking, why are we studying the cell and its structure in biochemistry? Doesn't this topic belong in anatomy or physiology? And isn't biochemistry primarily concerned with biochemical reactions? The answer to that is that the large majority of biochemical reactions occurring in the body occur at the cell. The cell is the site of these reactions. So, the study of biochemistry is incomplete without a basic understanding of cell structure and function. Now, here's a pictorial representation of what is obviously a factory, specifically the production floor of the factory. And you can see the different workers, both robotic and human, going about their specific tasks. And it's actually a perfect analogy for the cell. Because when you look at this image of a typical cell, you will see that the constituent parts of the cell seem like the different machines laid out on a factory floor. And in truth, their functions are very similar, as all of them are assigned different specific tasks and uh, they integrate their functions and coordinate them in such a way that the whole cell functions optimally. Here you can see an abstract representation of a particular cell component. So this is like a mini quiz, a small quiz. You have to identify it. I'm sure most of you have recognized it already because of its very distinctive appearance. For those of you who haven't, take a few more moments to have a good look at it and see if you can identify it. Okay, as I'm sure all of you have guessed by now, this is a mitochondrion. You can see the separate inner and outer membranes clearly as well as the characteristic infoldings of the inner membrane called cristae which increase its surface area and provide a greater surface for ATP synthesis. Now we will take some time to reflect on some observations about the cell that illustrate what makes the cell so interesting. Apart from the obvious fact that the cell is central to some critical disciplines such as clinical medicine, biology, anatomy, and physiology, and uh, evolutionary studies, and genetics, etc. It is also a marvel of nature and uh, it has some truly amazing properties. Previously, we have just compared the cell to a factory, but in reality, the cell is far more complex than any factory or workshop and we are going to see how and why that is the case. As you can see in this image, we have a factory on the left and on the right side we have a tiny grain of salt on the tip of an outstretched human index finger. Now keep in mind that the grain of salt is actually just a substitute for a cell because as we all know, Cells are microscopic and invisible to the naked eye and there is no way that uh, a cell can be seen in the same frame as an entire human hand. Now consider the disparity in size. On the one hand, a factory is usually spread over many acres of land, which is an area of tens of thousands of meters squared. On the other hand, the cell has a diameter which is around 10 times smaller and a volume which is around a thousand times smaller than a single grain of salt, which is itself something so minute that it is barely visible to the human eye. So, 
the difference in size between a factory and a typical cell is truly on an astronomical scale. In spite of its much smaller and in fact exponentially smaller size, the cell's capabilities are far more impressive as we are about to see. So in a typical factory, around 50 or so distinct processes may be going on at a given time and a maximum of 10 to 12 products are manufactured. In contrast, in a typical cell, there are often many hundreds or even thousands of processes occurring side by side and the products or biomolecules produced number in the lakhs or hundreds of thousands or whatever you want to call it. Even a very primitive and simple cell like a single E. coli bacterium has around 6000 different organic compounds. On top of that, the cell is a very dynamic structure. It detects changes in its environment very quickly and it actively responds to various internal and external stimuli and adapts accordingly. It regulates its activities in response to the needs of the organism and even carries out its own repair, growth as well as replication. So the cellular machinery is far more sophisticated than even the most advanced and technologically superior industrial plants. The cell can be defined as the structural and functional unit of life and the basic unit of biological activity. It is an enclosed compartment which is the site of essential biochemical reactions and it usually contains genetic material and is capable of self-replication. There are some exceptions among cells such as the RBCs, the mammalian RBCs as they lack a nucleus and genetic material and they do not replicate. The reason behind the absence of the nucleus in RBCs will be discussed later. As I mentioned earlier, the cell is an independent and self-reliant entity. This is because the cell performs nearly all those functions at the microscopic level that the living organisms performs at the macro level. These functions are ingestion and metabolism of nutrients, provision of energy, elimination of waste products, growth and repair, and self-replication. Now let's move on to the organelle. The organelle can be defined as a specialized subunit within a cell that performs a specific function. The term organelle is made up of the word organ and the suffix l. The suffix l means small or mini. So organelles are mini organs. The idea is that organelles are to a cell what organs are to the organism as they perform similar functions. Thus, Organelles can be thought of as the organs of the cell. Now we shall discuss the classification of organelles. Organelles are classified based on whether or not they are covered by a membrane. Some of the organelles such as the mitochondria and the Golgi apparatus and the nucleus etc. are enclosed within a lipid bilayer membrane and they are called membrane bound organelles. Some other organelles such as the ribosomes are not enclosed by a membrane and are called non membrane bound organelles. And these non membrane bound organelles are also called large biomolecular complexes or proteinaceous organelles as they are mainly made up of proteins. Here is a list of the cellular organelles with their main functions. First, we'll have a look at the membrane-bound organelles. We have the nucleus, 
and it controls and coordinates the cell's activities and contains the cell's genetic material. Then we have the mitochondria which provides for the cell's energy needs by generating ATP. The endoplasmic reticulum which is further of two types smooth endoplasmic reticulum and rough endoplasmic reticulum and its function is the synthesis of proteins, lipids, the detoxification of toxins and it is also involved in carbohydrate metabolism. Then the Golgi apparatus, it modifies and packages proteins and lipids for transport to other organelles or secretion to the outside. Then we have the lysosomes and their function is the breakdown of worn out organelles debris and foreign particles. Then we have the peroxisomes. Their function is to break down of fatty acids and they convert toxic hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. The vesicles which are involved in secreting substances outside the cells which is a process called exocytosis or ingesting nutrients into the cell which is called endocytosis and the storage and transport of nutrients and enzymes etc. Then we have the vacuoles which perform similar functions to vesicles and are slightly larger than ve vesicles. Then the endosomes. These act as central sorting stations for materials taken into the cell and for proteins and lipids within the cell. Now let's move on to the non-membrane bound organelles. We have the ribosomes which have a central role in protein synthesis. We have the cytoskeletons which is composed of microtubules, microfil microfilaments and intermediate filaments. These are different kinds of fibers. And the cytoskeleton provides structural support to the cells and helps them to maintain their shape. Then we have the centrioles which play an essential role in cell division. The nucleolus which lies within the nucleus, it has an important role in ribosome production. The proteasomes which degrade damaged and regulatory proteins. Apart from the organelles, the cell has a jelly-like ground substance called the cytoplasm which fills the cell and in, in which all the organelles lie. And the cell also has a membrane surrounding it which is called the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, which is composed of a lipid bilayer. So here is a neatly labeled diagram of a typical eukaryotic cell with the, the important organelles clearly shown. And in addition to the organelles, you can also see in this diagram small appendages on the outside of the small membrane cell membrane which are called microvilli and these are you know small finger like projections of the cell membrane and their purpose is that they increase the surface area of the cell for absorption. They are only found in certain certain kinds of cells such as the intestinal epithelial cells and not in all cells. So I would suggest that you pause the video at this stage and have a good look at the diagram and uh, see all of the organelles clearly. Okay, let's move on. So, having obtained a basic understanding of cell organelles and their types, we can now discuss the types of cell based on complexity level. First, we have the prokaryotes or prokaryotic cells. These are simple and primitive cells that lack a well-defined nucleus and they also lack membrane bound organelles such as nu nucleus and mitochondria and Golgi apparatus. Example is bacteria. Then you have the eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells which are advanced cells with a more complex structure and they possess a well defined nucleus and membrane bound organelles. Example plants and animals including humans. Now let's look at the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. First of all, the prokaryotic cells are smaller in size. They have a diameter of around 1 to 10 microns. 
the eukaryotic cells are much larger their diameter typically ranges from 10 to 100 microns secondly prokaryotic cells have a cell wall outside the cell membrane the exception is bacteria from the genus genus mycoplasma which lack a cell wall and eukaryotic cells may or may not have a cell wall plant cells have a cell wall and animal cells lack cell wall prokaryotic cells lack membrane bound organelles while eukaryotic cells possess these uh, membrane bound organelles and the nucleus is ill defined in prokaryotic cells in eukaryotic cells the nucleus is well defined and it has a membrane in prokaryotic cells dna is not associated with histones while dna is bound to histones in eukaryotic cells histones are basic proteins and uh, in eukaryotic cells the dna is coiled around the histones we shall discuss histones in greater detail later on and examples of both of the types of cells uh, as we have discussed earlier bacteria bacterial cells are prokaryotes and plants and animals are eukaryotes in fact fungi and uh, protozoans are also eukaryotes